Hello again, welcome back to the third and final part of this week's Theatre and Performance in Context lecture. As I said at the end of the second part, an interpretation of the play which more directly signals its intention to address Antigone's male canonicity and reinterprets it as a feminist text is Sunjay Kim's Riot Antigone. I'm going to show you a little trailer for it before we dive in. So, the production was originated at Northwestern University in 2014 and received its premiere three years later at La Mama Experimental Club in February 2017. Kim transforms the play into a punk rock musical, filtering the original narrative through the lens of the Riot Girl movement of the early 1990s, which was originated by bands such as Bikini Kill, whose frontwoman Kathleen Hanna you can see on your screens. This is realised in a succession of 12 songs which feature throughout the production, including numbers like War Mind, Girl Riot, which was the one you just heard and you'll hear more of later, and See You at the Front. I'm now going to show you a short clip of Rebel Girl by Bikini Kill, just to give you a sense of the aesthetic that inspired Kim. Okay, uh, you can listen to the rest of it in your own time. I invite you now, however, to listen to the song Girl Riot from Riot Antigone. And whilst listening, um, I want you to respond to the following points and think about how the song encapsulates the meaning behind Antigone, both the play and the character for modern audiences. One, what key emotions does this song express which also exist in the original text? If any, I think there are, but I'll be interested to see what you think. Two, which tools does Kim use in this song to recontextualize Antigone's problem within a contemporary feminist position? And finally, third, how would you stage this song? Okay, there's a staging exercise there for you. So I'm going to play the song, have a listen, enjoy. Feel free to sing along. One, two, three, four!
Okay, so uh, before we dive into the question of adaptation or appropriation, I just want to give you a little bit of context in terms of uh, the tradition that Riot Antigone comes from. It is by no means the only um, adaptation or indeed appropriation um, which marries a classical text or trope or theme with punk rock ideals. Um, other examples would be Carol Churchill's Vinegar Tom, which um, explores witch hunts um, and sets them to a punk rock soundtrack. You also have um, the musical version of Spring Awakening, um, which uh, does a similar thing um, with uh, Vedekin's play um, and adds a Green Day-esque punk soundtrack to it. It was written by the same people who indeed adapted Green Day's American Idiot for the stage. Um, and then you obviously have the musical pop crossover um, theme with other genres uh, like hip-hop in the form of Hamilton, for instance, and the Bomity of Errors. So this marriage of uh, canonical ideas, canonical texts, and a contemporary musical form is something that if you're interested in, there's certainly um, other avenues you could explore. But Right Antigone, as you've just heard, it does it in a very direct and visceral manner. So let's get back to this question now um, that you've got on your screens in front of you. Adaptation or appropriation? So um, when starting to investigate the differences between adaptations of canonical texts such as Antigone, it is important to discern whether or not they are adaptations at all. Adaptation is just one word for adaptation. Um, there is a sea of different terms um, that you might use uh, to describe uh, anything that affects a journey away from the source text as we are about to discover. So Julie Sanders proposes that an adaptation signals a relationship with an informing source text or original, whereas, an appro whereas appropriation frequently, as I've just hinted at, affects a more decisive journey from an informing source into a wholly new cultural product and domain. Evidently, then, the National Theatre production can be read as an adaptation which, although adding layers of new meaning through the director and actor's interpretations, design choices which evoke modern parallels, and the translated text itself, fundamentally follows the same narrative pattern and evokes themes familiar in its Sophoclean source. The term appropriation carries with it political connotations and indicates an artist wrestling control of the source text and charging it with uh, fresh energy and a specific spin. Um, and I think that is more immediately applicable to write Antigone um, for the purposes of our lecture. So Kim explains that this is a story about a punk rock girl band taking on this very classic myth that has been made in the male canon and bringing new meaning to it. Indeed, Kim not only adds music, which creates a supercharged reduction that condenses the play's exploration of a young woman defying a male autocrat, but adjusts and rearranges elements of the narrative. This includes the decision to open with Creon's edict and an imagined conversation between Antigone and Haman, rather than uh, the Antigone is mainly exchange, which you watched earlier. Kim also adjusts the ending, stopping the action just before Haman and Eurydice die. Although you might argue that this could serve to diminish the play's catharsis, Kim justifies it thus. For me, that's just a question of what's your lens. When you're adapting, it's really important for me to think about what's my zoom. You can't include everything, so my zoom is Antigone. I start with Antigone and I end the piece with Antigone's legacy, which is Ismene. And I'd really um, encourage you to think about that in your own work as you move forward. What's your Zoom when you're adapting something, especially, as I say, if it's a canonical work of literature? Because, uh, you know, Tom Stoppard in Rosencrantz and Guild's Turn Are Dead, um, his Zoom is those two characters who don't really get um, much stage time in Hamlet. Um, he enlarged their part to explore it from a specific angle, and that's exactly what Kim is doing um, with, uh, with Haman and Ismene in Riot's Antigone. And indeed, she enlarges Antigone's role herself as well to give her more nuance and to think more about her from a contemporary position. Um, so... I'm going to show you an example of this um, scene. So indeed, rather than having Antigone reject Ismene's offer of solidarity, Kim transforms this into a plea for Ismene to continue her fight 
and remain alive in order to tell the rest of her story. So this is the scene um, that comes very near the end of Riot Antigone. Let me go with you. What? No. Tell Uncle Creon it was my idea, please. It's mainly I need you to stay. I need you to live. That's what my mother and father would want. I don't want to live without you. Antigone, I was so scared. I was a coward. I should have done it with you. I'll never forgive myself. Listen to me. You did nothing wrong. But I should have done it. You didn't want to. Imagine if everyone was like me. The world would go insane. You are so good. You are going to do so much. Here. I'm going to fight for you all my life. I'll make Uncle Creon change his mind. It's not done. Okay. So in this exchange, Kim doesn't deliver a wholesale revision of the narrative, but shifts it slightly in order to offer a message which will connect more directly with her intended audience. Antigone and Ismene are still in conflict and both still express emotions located in the original Antigone. Antigone's desire that Ismene not join her and Ismene's regret at not doing so initially. However, by adding a conversation prior to Antigone's suicide, which does not take place in Sophocles' text, Kim is engaged in a process which mirrors her Greek predecessors. Sanders explains that even writers such as Ovid, Aeschylus and Euripides, who we might consider to be the source of much contemporary literary and cinematic appropriation of myth, were themselves refashioning previous mythical traditions. Just as Greek playwrights added new layers to the tales recounted by Homer, so Kim adds what we can call her own palimpsest, the definition of which you can see on your screens now, to Sophocles' Antigone. So palimpsest being... Um, Two definitions, a very old text or document in which writing has been removed and covered or replaced by new writing. And two, something such as a work of art that has many levels of meaning, types of style, etc. that build on each other. Antigone has enjoyed its enduring presence on stage, arguably because it presents a number of binary oppositions, individual versus state, love versus indifference, man versus woman, child versus adult, onto which directors and playwrights can map their own concerns and interests. The opening of Findlay's production, for instance, offers a wordless sequence of Crayon and his administration crowded around a screen, watching what we presume is the fight between Polynices and Eteocles. This image evokes a photograph of Barack Obama and other White House officials which was released on the day of the raid that killed Al-Qaeda leader Osama bin Laden in 2011, just a year before the production was released. And this is clear um, right down to a female performer who resembles Hillary Rodham Clinton in the same place as Clinton. Although this evocation isn't specifically sustained throughout the production, it serves as a cultural shorthand, which, for attuned audience members, immediately signals Findlay's intention to modernise Antigone and conceptualise it as a cautionary tale about cycles of vengeance and political corruption. Equally, in Riot Antigone, Kim delivers a remix of Sophocles' play which revivifies it for younger, diverse actors and audiences alike, asking why the voices of characters like Ismene and Haman should be diminished and amplifying them to create a more democratic space within the foundation text to discuss contemporary issues of discrimination. As Sanders suggests, myth is never transported wholesale into its new context. It undergoes its own metamorphoses in the process. Myth is continually evoked, altered and reworked across cultures and across generations. Findlay and Kim's productions ex exemplify this need for successive generations to reinterpret and revive canonical texts such as Antigone in order to help contemporary viewers understand why they were important to their first audiences and how tales of the past can inform and help us to address issues of the present. Thank you.